Thank you. Let's let us read the scriptures. Uh, nowadays, we are reading uh, Josh, the book of Joshua a lot. So let's open up to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua, chapter 3, verse 7. Joshua, chapter 3, from verse 7 to 17. Joshua, chapter 3, from verse 7 to verse 17. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. And Joshua said, Here, Hereby ye shall know that the living God. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive you, drive out from before you the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all earth passeth over, over, over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe men. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest that bear the ark of the Lord, and the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, and the waters that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon and heap. And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, and as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth at all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zaratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over the right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. I read up to verse 17. In Hebrews, it talks about how the law is the shadow of good things to come, and it is not the true image. In Colossians chapter 2, verse, 17, verse 12, it says, So these are... In Colossians 2, verse 12, it says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And so here, it's, in both these verses, it is talking about the future, about what is to come. So Jesus, too, like us, he had hands, he had a body, he had arms. He is the same person as us. But there is one thing different about Jesus and us, and is that his heart and his mind is different from us. So we both have the same body. But the life of living with the heart of Jesus and the life of living with my heart, it cannot be compared. So what God wants and who God wants is someone who has the heart of God, the heart of Jesus. And that is why when God sent Jesus to this earth, it's not like Jesus was taller than everyone. No, he was just like us, with the same body, has the same eyes, same ears, same nose, same lips. Jesus also breathed, breathed through his nose. He also spoke with his mouth. He ate with his mouth. And we too eat and speak with our mouth. And Jesus heard with his ears. And we are the same. But... There is one thing different. 
and it's that he has a different heart from us. He accepted the heart of God exactly as it was. So the reason why God sent Jesus is that we too, like Jesus, Jesus has the same ears as us, the same lips as us, the same teeth as us, the same uh, eyes as us. Everything is the same. But everything that Jesus did, He did it with the same heart as God. And everything we do, we do with a different heart, a different thought from God. And that is why when you look at that Jesus, and God, He created this heart inside of man. And the life of living according to our thoughts and the life of living according to Jesus' heart, uh, they are completely different. So people say, if you go to church, you got to do good deeds. You have to read the Bible a lot. You have to go to service. You have to do kind deeds. But God never said that. Because we cannot become good through man's effort. That's what God is saying to us. That is why he's saying all of our thoughts are evil. To throw away, to forsake all our thoughts. And when Jesus was in this earth, Just like we lived, just like Jesus lived according to God's thoughts, not His thoughts. If we also live according to God's thoughts, then we too can become like Jesus. God is talking about this process. So I'm someone who reads the Bible a lot, and when you read the Bible, the good that comes from our thoughts, God is not pleased with those things. Even in my heart, you know. And my thoughts and God's thoughts are completely different. But the heart of accepting that from God. Now let's talk about this. This morning, we read the book of Joshua. Everyone, if you stack bricks on top of each other, you can build a building. But can you stack water just like you stack uh, a brick? Bricks? Oh, it's nonsense, right? It's nonsense. That's right, right? But if you read the book of Joshua, it says the waters were stacked up against each other as they, as they split apart. That's what we read today, right? It says that the, the, that the waters are stacked on top of each other as they split apart. Now, how will you accept this? How can you accept this? So in your thoughts, you might think, how can water be stacked up? It's not like they're bricks. How can water be stacked up into each other and be and split apart like that? That's impossible. That's how we think, right? That's why the world of our thoughts The world that does not exist in our thoughts exists in God's heart. And so what God is saying is when His words are just like your thoughts, then you're able to follow along, right? Very joyfully. But when God's words are different from my thoughts, Now, what it is saying here in Joshua chapter 3. Now, they were crossing the Jordan River. And the Jordan River is always flooding. So the water, it comes up to the hills. And the priest, if they step on the Jordan River, it says that the water will no longer flow. And then he's telling them to go pass it, to pass it. And 
And I'm sure many thoughts pass by their minds, thinking, oh, is God trying to feed us to the fishes? Now, most people think that Jesus is telling us to don't lie, don't steal, don't do bad things, do good deeds, live a right life. That is how people think about Jesus. That's why if you go to church, you try to stop drinking, you try to stop smoking, you try not to lie, you try to help others, try to live kind lives, right? But that has nothing to do with what the Bible is saying. Because what the Bible says is, the Bible does not look into how kind you lived. or how much, how much offerings you gave. God is not very interested in that. But when my thoughts and God's thoughts are different, if I, if I believe in myself, then I live with my thoughts. But when I believe in God, I live a life that is different from God's thoughts. And so in the Bible, as you read Genesis, Leviticus, and then there's Moses, and Joshua, and David, you meet so many different types of people. But in Mark, Luke, John, We have two eyes, one, we, we have two eyes, ten fingers, two legs, one nose, one mouth. Jesus has the same body as us, and he came in the same form as us, and we saw him. And when we look at the life of Jesus and how he lived his life, Jesus did many things that we just could not understand at all. then must we follow that Jesus or do, I, do we need to follow our thoughts? There's a big difference in that. And so if Jesus, if he came to this earth, he came to die at the cross and he was crucified at the cross in order to save us, Jesus, he did this. That's what he did for us. then that means even to us, God, He gives us something that's different from our thoughts. The providence of God. Through the Bible, we are able to discover it. Nowadays, Christians all over the world, how are, how is Christianity flowing? They want to live more kind. They're leading people to lead kinder, gentle, more kinder lives. good lives whether it suits me or not but there are not many people who want to live a spiritual life where whether it fits me or not I'm, able, I'm willing to follow the heart of Jesus and the important thing is no matter who it may be amongst you if you precisely know this And just like Jesus walked, according to the Bible, if I listen to the word of Jesus, and following when my thoughts are right, anyone can do that. But it's saying, follow something that does not fit my thoughts at all. is something that's very difficult for our brothers and sisters to do and we do not want to do that. I got married and while living with my wife, I have many things that I'm thankful to for my wife and I know that she, she has gone through a lot of hardships because of me. You know, nowadays, you know, my wife, she lives almost like the first lady, but Back then, we really lived a difficult life. 
So I always thought to myself that I haven't been treating my wife well. She's been through a lot of hardships because of me, because of my lifestyle. And once we got a house, and it was a second floor building built, uh, built out of wood, and there was a living room there. There we would have meetings, we would have service, we would read the Bible. And we use one small room by the side. And what the owner said, this is a wooden house. So whatever happens, don't make any fire here. And that's right. You shouldn't make a fire inside a wooden house. So we made a small furnace out of coal in front of the house. So my wife, she would make the rice and she would cook the she would, and she would go outside and cook the rice outside and then when it's done she would bring inside and I was I felt so sorry to my wife because one day my wife ate some rice and for the first time as a husband I told my wife honey I'm really sorry next time when we move I'll find a house that has a nice kitchen for you and my wife she looked at me and what she said was Honey, what are, you, what are you talking about? You know, did we, did we come here to live a comfortable life? You know, we, we didn't come here to, as, as you know, missionaries of the gospel. And it was my first time, the, the only time where my wife, she really touched me. She mo motivated my heart. And I said, I told my wife, thank you so much. And then from then on, I won't say anything else. So what happened? And um, that was the end of our conversation. And once I went on a trip, it was just after I had gotten married. I wanted to buy a present for my wife. But I didn't know what to buy for women. And I couldn't ask people. So I thought and thought, so I bought a blouse. I wanted to buy a blouse for her. So for the first time, we went to a store that, that sold women's clothing. Clothing, so I bought a blouse and I gave and I brought it to my wife. I said, "Honey, I have a gift for you." And I thought she would be really thankful. I gave it to her. She says, "How much was this?" And I bought it for forty thousand. But I, I I wanted to tell her it was twenty thousand. But I told her it was forty thousand one. And then what she said was. Why did you buy this for 40,000 won? And then I said to myself, I'll never buy you a gift again. And from then on, I, I never bought her another present afterwards. You know, if I bought her another present, we might have gotten to an argument again. That's the difference in our heart. But we got married and now we've been living together for 50 years. And once I went to Russia and I told her I lived, I told them I lived with her for 50 years. And they asked me, you've never gotten remarried? I said, no. And they asked me, how can you live with one woman that long? <laughs> and I thought, wow, you, you, you Russians, you don't know anything. Do you know how difficult it is to live with one woman for 50 years? How could you live with two women for 50 years? And as I got older and older, we, uh, we became closer and closer. My wife, you know, in her life, she lived in such a difficult world. She lived such a difficult life. life. So I tried to understand my, you know, my wife. But there are still some things that I couldn't understand about her. Once I got in a big fight with my wife, and while reading the Bible, the, the Bible verse says, oh, for it's all the wives to submit to your husbands. So I told my wife about that Bible verse. And then she, my wife said to me, I thought my wife would say, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I see the Bible says for the wives to submit to, my, to husbands. But then she said, she looked straight at me in my eyes. She said, why didn't you read the next verse? The next verse says, 
husbands, love your wives as, the, as, the, as God loves the church. And then she asked me, why don't you love me like, uh, like the husband should love the wife? And so I couldn't, I couldn't win the argument against her. So, you know, marriage life is not simple, everyone. But by the grace of Jesus, we have been living together for over 50 years. And we've been living for 50 years. And I could see my wife, she, you know, she's losing strength in her body. And I could see how she uh, now kind of sides with me. I'm so thankful, and I'm such a good husband. As I saw my wife getting weaker and br her body getting brittle, brittle I, I felt really sorry. I thought, you know, if she dies, how will I live without her? So I told my wife, please live a long, long time. You know, everything else, it's okay. You can burn the rice. Nowadays, you know, she doesn't burn the rice because everything's, we have an electric cooker, but I mean, that's how we live our life. There are, there's some elders here. I think um, they've all lived, you know, similar lives to me. And the same goes for your li the life with your spouse. If a man and a woman are the same, they wouldn't be a man and a woman. They're different. They're clearly different. I'm sorry to say this, but you know, there are many men here, but men, they think deeply over something that's really nothing, no matter who it may be. Because they think, if I make a mistake, this is going to be difficult for my family. You know, if I do everything so lighthearted like my wife, my our house will, will break down, and that's true. You know, women are very uh, focused on one aspect and sometimes that causes a lot of problems too. But in men, no matter how lacking they may be, they always think, you know, I'm it's because you know I'm still keeping this family up uphold, upholded. And if it wasn't for me, this family would end. All the husbands think like that, right? But and women, they don't want to acknowledge that sometimes. And that's the difference between the man and the woman. Is that right? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Now a couple, they're completely different. Their thoughts are different. The way they think, they think is different. But men, when they think about something, they think so many different ways about it before deciding. And women, they just look at one thing and they just accept it right away. And that's why these, you know, scammers and the frauders, they're very good at uh, targeting women. And also when it comes to believing Jesus, women, they believe in Jesus right away. And that's when it it's really good when it comes to Christianity. But men, if you tell them to believe in Jesus, they think, what will my uncle think about it if I say I believe in Jesus? My uncle, he paid for my college and he's a Buddhist. What will he think if I say I believe in Jesus? Well, the, the manager of my, of my company, he's Catholic. What will he say if I go to church? Men are so complicated. They think about everything like that. And if they don't think that way, it will affect their family or their household. So when men become 30, 40, life becomes so difficult because they think so much. You know, and all they need to do is actually just focus on the Bible and everything gets solved. But men and women, they're completely different. And women, they really need to, the sisters need to listen to this. A really wise woman she will listen to her husband, even if she thinks she is right. And a true uh, congregant member of the church, not what looks possible or not possible in my eyes, but what does the Bible say? If you incline your heart to what the Bible says, not only your family, but the church, Everything is supposed to be so beautiful. But people, human beings are the same. Satan. You know. You know, Satan, you know, he is so, so wise when it comes to tricking and deceiving people. That he makes us go against the, the basic principle of believing in Jesus. 
and say that he puts different thoughts, different things in our hearts. And these are the works of Satan. So the interesting thing about reading the Bible, once I was speaking to a university, a chancellor, and he heard that I had arrived, so he came one hour, he drove one hour to meet me, and I spoke about the Bible with him. And I opened to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. I told him to read it. Oh, I know this Bible verse. I've memorized it. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I told him to read verse 24. And then being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So verse 23 is for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does verse 24 say? And verse 24 means... If I pray diligently, I will become righteous. And he's a university president. He was saying something that was completely different from the Bible. Why? Because he had a completely different mindset. He was reading that Bible with a completely different mindset. So I told him to read it again. And he said, if you're diligent, you can become righteous. That's what he told me. So I said to him, there is an English Bible there. Verse 24, it says, The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You have been justified freely through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In English, it says, Being justified in English. It says, Justified. And I said, Justified. And he was shocked. And he was so shocked. The fact that we have been justified. It's not done through our works, but it's because Jesus redeemed us. That is why we became justified. We call this grace. Then grace it's not grace if it's done through my works. Nowadays, so many people they try to be redeemed through the race, grace of Jesus. Instead of grace, tried to pray diligently they tried to repent it's a very simple so what we understand is that they think that their good works will be accumulated but that that's nonsense but God is saying oh he, we, we think that water cannot be you know, cannot heap on top of each other, cannot be stacked on top of each other. But gee, God is saying, God is saying that, that the water will stop and then there'll be a dry ground on the, and then the waters will stack up on, on each side. And for water to stack up, it doesn't make sense. But what happens if, the, you know, while you're walking across, what happens if they'll stack the water, if it starts flowing again, then everyone will drown. So it doesn't make sense to us. And so many of these things occur uh, as we read the Bible. Now today, most people living spiritual life, they have their own, you know, standards, and they try to look at things with their with their standards. And that's why so many times, how they understand the Bible is completely different. And so God, what God says is, He sent Jesus, and before He came. He said he promised to send Jesus since the beginning, and that day we, just like Jesus did, all we need to do is believe in that God. But the evil spirit works inside of us. It makes us to live a life that's completely different. So if we live our life according to our standards, there are so many things that doesn't suit us in the Bible. And that is why this Bible, if we believe it exactly as it is, then we cannot receive it exactly as it is. I went to Hong Kong and we had a pastor's conference with over a thousand people and I preached the gospel to for about four days. And what really shocked them was 
They said, you know, you know, you know the ceremonies of Pastor Parker is not special. It may look special, but the important thing is, no matter what it seems like in our eyes, the words of Jesus is are right. In the Bible, Romans 3, verse 24, God calls us justified. Being justified freely. So God says, we have been justified. And when God called us justified, it's not because we gave a lot of offerings or gave a lot of gifts or because we prayed all night. It's not because of that. When God had gave the standard of us being justified, it had nothing to do with our deeds. He looked at Jesus and he called us justified. Do you understand? So when God gave us the law, if we keep the law well, we'll go to heaven, right? But the Bible it tells us that there wasn't a single, not even a single person who kept the law perfectly. That is why not a, even a single person can enter heaven by keeping the law. And that is why God, He changed the law. And how did He change the law? When you play soccer, a game of football, right? There's 11 people on each team, right? In a game of football. No matter how well you play on your own, it's not important. All 11 people they need to have the same heart and have good teamwork with one another. And if you can just play, put in the most goals, then you'll win the football match, right? No matter how much I do well on my own, if our hearts aren't the same, it's, it's not important. Likewise, if you go to the game that, take, uh, that goes to heaven, uh, when you watch the Olympic Games, let's say for example, there's a marathon or or a skating or swimming like when there's these games it, it doesn't require all Koreans to go out there and, and run to get a gold medal but we choose one person to represent our country and if he gets first place and gets a gold medal at the Olympics then we get a gold medal and if he comes in first place at the swimming then we get first place so we look at the one representative athlete and he decides for us, right? It's not that all Koreans go out and all of them need to be able to run well. That's, that's not what is required for us to gain the, the gold medal in that category. And even if I've never run a full course, Olympic full course, if, and even if I can't run well, but if our athlete goes there and gets first place, that means Korea has got first place, right? So even if our legs are broken, we're standing, we're lying down in the hospital, if that athlete does well, then we get a gold medal, right? So God, when He decides our salvation, our uh, you know standard, He chose that standard. So who is our athlete? It is Jesus, Jesus Christ. Do you understand? So that Jesus Christ, according to the standard of God, He ran according to that standard. And he perfectly came in first place and he, he got the gold medal then that means we whether we're lame whether we can't walk whether we're disabled we all got the gold medal just like in the olympics likewise god he chose this kind of law do you understand in order to save us and that is why it's not really important he's not even he's not even interested in what we're uh, good at doing when you play, when you watch the Olympics, when you watch the marathon, who do you need to train? All you need to train is that one athlete, right? You know, it's not for us to all go there and, and get trained, right? No, we can sleep, we can take a nap, we can do whatever we want. But that athlete, if that athlete comes in first place and gets the gold medal, that comes to South Korea and the South Korean flag goes up and it says South Korea got a gold medal, right? So God... In this world, there's, only, there's not a single person who served God perfectly. And that is why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Do you, is that right? And that son, Jesus Christ, he did according to the will of God.
And he fulfilled it perfectly. And by his contribution, we were able to receive salvation. By his grace, we receive salvation. It's not that we did anything good or anything well. It has nothing to do with our goodness or our good deeds. Amen? Only, only five people said amen. Is that amen? Yes, amen. And that is why in spiritual life, it doesn't, it doesn't, what's important is not how much I read the Bible, how many times I read the Bible, how much money I gave to God, how many good, good deeds I did. That has nothing to do with my salvation. That has nothing to do with me. That is a wrong spiritual life, a mistaken spiritual life. The law of God says that by the redemption of Jesus Christ, we have been justified. Instead of looking at that verse, people, Jesus says clearly that we are justified. He justified us perfectly without a single blemish. Do you understand? But nowadays, many churches, they are saying that I need to do good deeds. I need to be holy. I need to not commit sin. That I need to be perfect and justified in order to go to heaven. But we have already, we've already failed at that marathon. Because we've already committed too many sins. We've already committed too many evils. We, no matter how much we try in the standards of God, we cannot reach the standard of God. That is our life. If we could reach God's standard, it would not be done through us. It would be done through God. So no matter who it may be, there is no one who reached the level of God. That is why he sent Jesus Christ. And I've met so many pastors. And many pastors with that kind of mindset. They think I need to do well. You know, I, I need to do good deeds in order to receive salvation. But the Bible is completely different. That is grace. It's not by mine. It's accepting what God has done as mine. It's accepting Jesus' works as mine, His justification as mine, His death at the cross as mine. And that is why by the grace of Jesus, I receive salvation. That is why spiritual life, the reason why it becomes so difficult, there is not a single person who became righteous through His works. And that's why He sent Jesus Christ. And God, He wanted to give the wages of Jesus' Jesus' works unto us. So no matter how much we commit sin, no matter how many evils we have committed, even though we are deserving of going to hell, but Jesus has already received the punishment for us, and that Jesus, He did the good works, and that becomes mine. And it has been exchanged. Has been, it has been, uh, um, His has been given to us. That's so why no matter how much we commit sins, we are righteous. Even if we steal, we are righteous. And we are righteous and holy. Why? Because me committing adultery, stealing, lying, that has already gone over to Jesus. And His righteousness has come over to me. So now, now we are looking at how much sin has Jesus committed? How good is Jesus? How righteous is He? That is, should be our stand. That is what we should be looking at. Once I went to the United States, I got on an economy class. And when God saved me, He made me kind of short. He didn't let me grow. So after six years, uh, six years after I was born, there was the uh, Korean War. So I ate anything I could eat. And I was always lacking nutrients, and that's why I'm so short. But my son, you know, he's a lot taller than me because he, was, he grew up in a later, later generation. And they said my grandson will grow to be 190 centimeters. But now the plane, and the reason why I like taking the plane, if I sit on the economy class, it suits my body completely. And I sit down, I lie down, I sleep. But really, I feel really sorry for those people. They're so tall. 
their legs don't even go to fit in the seats in the, in the plane and, and they they have such a hard time and it's true those who have really long legs you know the economy is too small for them and they're cramped i could see them having a hard time and <laughs> i wanted to almost exchange heights with them but for me it's it's so comfortable so i like riding economy but one brother you know he came to me and he said that he got the fir- uh, he got uh, first class so he said, Pastor, look, I have a first class plane. Oh, okay, have a have a nice trip. And I got on the economy seat and the brother came to me and he said, Pastor, Pastor, please go to the first class, please change seats with me. And he said, No, no, I like I like economy. No, you bought the first class, go take the first class, it's okay. And he said, Pastor. I didn't buy this first class for me to ride. Why why do you think I bought the first class? I bought it for you. And I said that's your case. <laughs> you know, I'm going to take the uh, economy. I'm you know, I like economy. You, you uh, take the first class. And later on the brothers and the brother was so sad <laughs> cuz I wouldn't take his seat. And I said no, I like I enjoy economy class. And he, he was almost at the verge of tears. And I said no, it's okay. You uh, take the first class. And the other elder said, oh, pastor, wow, just please take this, take a seat. So I was so happy as I went to take the first seat. And I, and I really enjoyed it. You know, you should, you, should, you should take first class. It's really nice. Now that brother, he took the first class. He gave that first class seat to me. And that brother took my economy class. And the brother had that in plan. He planned that. You know, he, you know, you know, he came with me to America. There was no need for him to come, and he bought the first class for me. If I continued to sustain the economy class, he would probably, you know, cry because he was so. And what we call this is, we call that. That's what we call grace, right? I didn't pay for it. I didn't, and I'm able to take the first class, right? So whether, you, if you went to heaven by doing good works and doing good deeds, then that's not grace. That is a wage, right? What is grace? Grace is doing nothing, having done nothing, but receiving the wages for your sins. Why? Because my my wage was supposed to be death and uh, hell, but Jesus, he received the wages of my sin, and he paid for it. And instead of him sitting on the glory spot, glory seat in heaven, he gave that seat to me. That is what we call grace. And so for, if we go to heaven by doing good deeds, that's not grace. And whoever works, uh, his wage is, uh, is counted as debt, not as grace. So when we know about this world of God, You know, we who were uh, sinners and who had this mindset of sinning, and Jesus who loved us, God who loved us, His thoughts and our thoughts are so different. So no matter who it may be, no one has the same thought as God. There's no one who has the same thoughts as God, do you understand? That's why we need to throw away our thoughts. Because you have already committed sin, we have no choice but to go to hell. And so he gave the sins over to Jesus and he crucified him on the cross. And just like he exchanged the plane tickets, Jesus, he was crucified on the cross, paid for our wages, and we instead, we receive the glory that he was supposed to receive. And that is what we call the grace of God. Do you understand? So we, for me doing good, and me doing kind deeds, it has nothing to do with that. 
we were supposed to receive this curse, but Jesus, we changed it with Jesus, and I went to the first. I got into the first uh, class. He went to the economy class. Likewise, it is nothing. It has nothing to do with whether I did well or not. Because if I paid for it, then that's a wage. It's a debt, not a grace. So Joshua, what is Joshua saying here in the book of Joshua? He has to enter the land of the Can of, of Canaan, but by his way, there's no way for them to cast away the set, cast out the seven tribes in the land of Canaan. But according to God, you know God wanted him to enter the land of Canaan because He's always going before us, fighting before us. So from now on, all the things that occur to us, don't do it with my way, but do it with the way of God. Do you understand? Have you ever seen the, the movie Ten Commandments? You see the, the water, it stops. It stopped flowing and it's stacked on top of each other. So you couldn't understand if you saw. And imagine walking past that water. What happens if the water st suddenly starts flowing again and breaks down? If that water stopped flowing, then everyone would st uh, start flowing again. Everyone would die, right? But now we, we who have the faith to believe in God, in our eyes, it doesn't make sense that the water has stopped. But if God says it has stopped, it has stopped. And we know that the water starts flowing and we will die, but if God tells us to walk, then we will walk. You understand? That is what we call believing in God. So, like Elder Park, he's also said as well, elders as well. You know, spiritual life is very easy. Why is it easy? It's very easy. Jesus does everything that we need to do, but spiritual life becomes difficult because we are trying to do what Jesus needs to do. That's why it becomes so difficult. The reason why spiritual life does not work out, it's not because it is difficult, but it's because it's so easy. You understand? Those who go to hell, they don't go to hell because they commit a lot of sin, but it's because they're so kind. Do you understand? Do you, uh, do you guys understand? Our pastors from, do you understand what I'm saying, pastors from overseas here? So we try to put our good in front of us, but with our goodness, we cannot reach the glory and the righteousness of God. That's why He gave our sins over to Jesus and He gave the goodness and the righteousness of Jesus unto us and that is why we are able to go to heaven. Usually, uh, in the, f the first class has about 12 seats. But but usually there's like three uh, assistants helping in that first class, three flight attendants. And once and even if you just move a little bit, they come to try to help you. And I wanted to exercise a little bit. And then the flight attendant came and gave me a small, and gave me a small um, bamboo tree uh, stump and told me to step on it. And I jumped on it and accidentally broke it. And it looked really expensive. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, it broke. What should I do? And I thought they would tell me to refund it, pay $1,000. But they said, oh, it breaks easily. Should I give you a new one? And they'll only do that because it's the first class, right? So that's grace. Right? But so I'll never step on it again, though. I'll step on my feet instead. Why would I step on that? It's so expensive. Yeah, I should have just stepped on it, but I don't know why I jumped on it. Anyways, so such things that happen. So, you know, first class, you paid for it. That's why you're able to write it. But for us, just like if someone pays for it for me, I can take it. Likewise, God, he paid for the wages through Jesus. 
that's why it has nothing to do with whether I did well or not, but by Jesus' wage, we are able to enter heaven. That is what we call grace. And it is not done by our works. Do you understand? So spiritual life, this concept of spiritual life, if we change it, Jesus, what kind of a person is Jesus? He believed the word of God exactly as it was. You try to believe in what you can believe. If you heard the words, tomorrow about this time, a sea of fine flowers shall be sold for a shekel in the city of Samaria. If you heard that, you would not believe it, right? That's why we need to change our plans, our thoughts. And no matter what we do, we cannot go to heaven by our works. That is why God sent one person that will bring us to heaven. And he had the same eyes as us, same ears, same nose. He came in the same form as us to this earth. And he was Jesus. And then he said to us, Hey, look, he has the same eyes, same nose, same uh, fingers, same arms, same legs as you. But this Jesus, look at what he does. Look at him, everyone. Look at what he's doing. That is what God is telling us. And that is why he sent Jesus. And what Jesus did, he gave it to us. And the judgment and the curse that we were supposed to receive, he put on to Jesus and that is why we were able to go to heaven. That is what we call grace. And that's what occurred. So the people during Joshua's time, they might, they might have been afraid. What happens if this water starts flowing again? How can this water stack up to, amongst each other and become a heap like this? Can I really cross across the water? I can't even swim. What happens if the water flows again? You know, if they thought that way, that would be a problem, right? And we didn't do anything good. But most people, they say we are sinners. We are sinners before God. Why? Because I look like a sinner in my eyes. So in my eyes, I look like a sinner. Whether I believe it or not, if Jesus says that I'm righteous, that I'm righteous, that is believing in God. But if he says, but if you say no, I'm not, I'm not righteous. I'm a sinner. When God calls you righteous, then that is being arrogant, not believing in God's words and believing in your thoughts. Uh, do you understand? Is it a bit confusing? Can you understand? Then everyone, now let's look. Now let's look into the Bible. If you really agreed up to that point, then not in just that aspect. God calls me righteous then. And the Bible calls me righteous. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. By His grace that we have been justified. In Romans 3, verse 24, we have already been justified. God has called us justified. This is not Pastor Parks, or this is the Bible. This is the Word of God. This is what the Word of God is telling us. Amen? So if the Word of God says that we are righteous, then I should say I'm righteous. Not say, no, Lord, I'm a sinner. Does that make sense? No. It doesn't make sense at all. Why? That is not believing in the Bible. That is believing in your thoughts. So spiritual life, like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, <laughs> The scribes, these people, do they live a good spiritual life? And the priest, these people, they really could not live spiritual life. Why? Because they were believing in their thoughts, right? So now in spiritual life, according to this spirit, this principle, right? I think I'm lacking, I'm weak, I'm dirty, I'm deceitful. I'm evil. I cannot become righteous. I cannot become holy on my own, no matter what I do. However, 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 when I lived in Kimcha, my wife, <coughs> my wife, you know, she uh, she had my daughter, and at that, at that time, my uh, sister-in-law. She worked at the at the, at the uh, hospital, so uh, she had the baby there. 
And that day, Eunsu was born, and what my sister-in-law said, Eunsu, you're so blessed. Today is my salary day. And so my sister-in-law, she prepared everything for me, for, uh, for, us, for her. So I was so thankful to my, uh, to her. But then we didn't have the money to go back to Kim Chun. At that time, there was one missionary. He was passing by Kim Chun. He was going to another city. I spoke to him, and I said to him, "When you go to Kim Chun." My wife, she just had a baby. Can we go together with you? I said, oh, it's fine. You can come with us. So we took the, you know, the train and we went with him to Kim Chun. And when I think about it now, it was about lunchtime. I should have at least you know, invited him to our house for lunch because he brought us all the way to Kim Chun. He just dropped us off out there at the highway and we, just, we walked. At the time, I had nothing. And I just you know, coincidentally spoke to that missionary to go with him on the way to Kim Chon. And there were three seats in the back. I asked him, you know, can my wife and I and the baby take the back seat of your car on your way to Kim Chon? And he was so happy. He said, okay, let's go together. And so we came. And when I look at it now, that missionary, he wasn't someone I knew well. I just you know, greeted him and I spoke to him. I don't know how that, you know, that suited so perfectly I said to him, you know, my wife and I, we have a baby. We just had a baby. Can we go with you together to Kim Chon? And he said, oh, come, come with us. It's okay. So I realized, you know, you know, for my, for my daughter, God has to prepare a car and everything for us. So we waved him goodbye. And so such things, little by little, such so small things, I'm really thankful for them. And when I live my life inside the Lord, the Lord, he never put his hands inside my pocket, but he always knew how much money I had. And he never opened into my account, but he knew how much I had. And I, he knew how much, what I needed to do, and how much money I needed. And as we lived our life, I was so thankful to God for what he had done. So everyone, no matter how much faith that I, do, I may not have, you know, I have actually more doubt than I have faith. A long time ago, I used to doubt people so much. I don't really have a good personality as well. But no matter how much faith I may not have, but in the Bible, and I think about each step by step, I have no choice but to believe in God when I see how He has led me all the way here. In the life of living, of believing in Him, in the life of living in, uh, and believing in me, it cannot be compared cannot be compared. So now, so now I'm an old man. Back then I was a very young man. Now I'm an old man. And once I, I went on a subway and a man said to me, oh, oh, sir, grandpa, sit here. I thought, wow, I'm already an old man. People, they're calling me old man, old man, you know, as I live my life. 
And while living life, God never once did he give up on my on my uh, on the promise. He protected it. He told me, "Seek and you shall f- ask and you shall g- find. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open to you." And there you need to draw a firm line. My thoughts and God's thoughts. The life of living according to my thoughts and God's thoughts. And if you draw a firm line, then you know perfectly, precisely, to be- when you believe in the word of God, that he will work and you will go exactly according to that word. So today, it's not that you can't live a spiritual life because you're lacking, but it's beca- it doesn't work because if you live a spiritual life too well, God wants to give it to us for free. Even forgiveness of sin is for free. Everything is by grace. Everything is done by grace. Uh, Recently, we had the Christmas cantata in the United States. We had it once in L.A., once in Las Vegas, once in Salt Lake City, once in Denver. I went to five of uh, Christmas cantatas, and in LA, we had, we had the performance at the three, at three o'clock. After everyone had entered, I went to the front seat, and all the people there I, I didn't know who they were. As I saw the cantata. You know, I you know I what wa- wa- I cried so much as I saw the performance, and I saw those next to me. They were all crying. So next time, I thought uh, we need to provide handkerchiefs for them. You know, maybe buy I sell handkerchiefs for them five dollars, ten dollars, three dollars. You know, one dollar for the tissue. These they were crying so much. The cantata completely took our heart away. And so I went and I preached for about 30 minutes. And I was so thankful and so touched. And at the end, I gave gave them the book. This is how I received forgiveness of sins. Uh, I gave a book to each and every one of them. They were so happy. And in L.A., you should have 3,500 or 4,000, sometimes 5,000 people attend. And I could see the end of the stadium, the end of the hall. And as I saw them leaving, and seeing how happy they were. These U.S. citizens, you know, when, when else would they be this happy in their lives? For this time. So in September, October, well, we, we preached this joy to almost 130, 140,000 people. And I received such a great grace from Jesus. And I was so happy to see them so happy. So to the to the U.S. citizens, to over hundred thousand people, there's almost three hundred pe- um, three hundred million people in the U.S. If we want to preach to all of them, we have to do it for a long time. So this love of Jesus that I received, this grace of Jesus, this happiness, I wanted to come exactly into my heart, so that now. I want to give this happiness to others, give this joy to others. I was someone who used to cause problems to others, but while he is le- living in me, so many people have changed. Once I was uh, preaching in a jail, 
and I was uh, signing their personal information. And there was one person from Gyeongbuk Sunsan, and that's my hometown. And I said, are you from Sunsan? Oh, I'm also from Sunsan. Oh, really? And I spoke with him. Do you have family members? Oh, yes, I do. And he says, no, none of my family members have come to me for over 10 years after I entered the army, uh, entered the prison and he would send he would send his letters but no one none of them would reply to his letters and it became time for him to leave the uh, the, uh, the prison to be released and I asked him, do you have a place to go he says yeah, I know where to go and I told him do you want to stay at our church we have an empty room and he was so happy so he came to our room And one day it had been about it had been about ten days, and he wanted to leave. And I asked him, "You know, I'll leave and witness." And I said, "No, why can't you witness while staying here? Why do you want to leave?" He said, "No, that he'll leave." And he kept saying that he wanted to leave. So I said to him, "Brother, hey, brother." No, I, I can't. I, I know I, I'm not able to give you the best service, the best life. But you know, can't we eat together, live together like this, like we're doing right now? And his brother, he started crying. He says, "Oh, thank you, Pastor. I'll stay." So what thought this brother had was, you know, this pastor he told me to come and stay with him. And now he's he doesn't want to live with me, you know. You know he wants to, you know, he can't kick me out. But, you know, he just has no choice but to accept me. That's why he's just forcefully staying. He's just, you know, acting like he wants me to stay here. But you know, once he really saw my heart, and I told him I really wanted you to stay here, then he could really understand my heart. So at the time at our church, I wanted that brother to get married, but he was a bit old. So I told the sisters, I told the brothers, you know, I want that brother to get married. Is there any sister here? Oh, there's that one sister at our church. She lives by herself. And I think the brother might be interested in that sister. I said, oh, that's nice. So I called the sister. I said to her, hey, sister, everyone else has a couple. Why are you always alone by yourself? I don't have a husband, she said. Where's your husband? He died. And I said, oh, wow, that's so sad. I said to her, I don't want to see you coming alone by yourself. I really can't see that. Get married. She says, okay, then get, then uh, get, okay, I want to get married. I thought, oh, okay, that's good. So I said to her, then no matter whoever I recommend you, will, will you get married to them? Yes, pastor, I'll, I'll marry whoever you recommend. Get married to that brother. Who? Her? That the murderer? And she was so shocked. And she changed her heart and she left. And she didn't want to go to church. Everything was going well. So I thought, oh, what should I do? Then one day, she came to me. And she was crying. I said, hey, don't worry. You know, there's a lot of, you know, sisters for him to get married to. You, you don't have to get married to him. It's okay. God has prepared another sister for her, for him. But she said, no, Pastor, that's not, no, it's, no, it's okay, go away. You don't, you, know, you don't have to marry him. She said, Pastor, I thought about it, and I was so arrogant. That brother is so much more precious than me. I was so arrogant, and I said that. Please, uh, please, uh, you know, let me get married. You know, you know, she said, she and I said, no, you know, I acted like I didn't want her. I, 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 like I said, no, but she said she wanted to get married. So we got them married. This brother, you know, his, uh, his father had passed away. And there was some land under his name. And his elder brother took the land. 
And the brother says, I can't give you all the land. I'll give you this much amount of money. So with that money, he went and he got a small uh, house. He also got a car. And the two of them, they you know, were selling socks. They were doing business. And in Agassiz, they have such a nice time together. The two of them, they look so beautiful together. And obviously, they do get in arguments, but they were so precious and so beautiful together. But Jesus, he, you know, he saved his brother from prison, gave him a family, a wife, to live a happy life together. And I was just so happy. Those who are in sin, Jesus, he wants to save them from sin. And he wants to fulfill our lackings. He wants to uh, heal our sickness. And he wants to bestow his grace upon us. It's just that our hearts do not flow with God. But if our hearts flow with God, that's why I'm so thankful that I've become a pastor. Instead of being in darkness, but now by the grace of God, becomes grace and I've changed starting from me so I'm so thankful and it's not that I've done anything good or well Joshua crossed the Jordan River and God is telling them to cross the river cross the Jordan River the water will stop flowing and they thought to themselves, what will happen if the water starts flowing again? Then you know, it will become food for the fish. What if the fish are hungry? That is how our thoughts flow. But the word of God, though it does not fit us, God, he's the king above us. And what he says, all we need to do is believe it exactly as it is. In my thoughts, it does not fit my thoughts. That's why I need to you know, forsake my thoughts. And if I believe in the word of God, then from then on, God, he will work inside of us. The heart of God will call us. And when God created us, how did God create us? He made us to accept the word of God exactly as it was. And as we receive it, then it enters our heart in God because it work inside of our heart. And you have a hope we did not have before. Happiness we had, did not have before. It's such a blessed life. On the opposite, if we live according to my ways, my thoughts, and we do not listen to God, we really live a painful, a difficult life. And God wants us to live this kind of blessed, graceful life. As we give thanks to Him and we praise Him. Uh, let us pray. We'll have time for individual prayer.